I'm Peter Briggs. Um, I'm here at the unveiling of Jimmy Hogan's um, headstone. Uh, we're in Berlin Cemetery. Uh, we have a large amount of dignitaries here. Um, Jimmy Hogan's um, influence has affected so many different clubs and countries. Um, his legacy is completely um, unfathomable, really. Um, we've got representatives of Celtic Football Club here, uh, representatives of Burnley Football Club, Fulham, Aston Villa, um, and Bolton Wanderers, as well as friends and family and people who um, either knew Jimmy or have been influenced by Jimmy in some way. We've got a number of ex-Burnley play uh, players here, um, Colin Waldron, uh, Paul Fletcher, uh, Brian Flynn, um, Frank Casper are all here today to pay their respects. What I'm going to do is I'll take us uh, to Graveside where I've got a little camera set up um, and we will set up um, and we will play from there. Um, there is a Catholic priest conducting today's service um, and um, we're going to unveil Jimmy's headstone. Um, and I hope you really enjoy it. So, without further ado, I'll just turn this round and we'll get going. See how many people are here for Jimmy. It's probably about 40 people. That's quite a large number for somebody that's been passed away for so long uh, that his grave has remained unmarked for this amount of time as well. And just hope that we, we give him something that he can recall, remember for today anyway. The ceremony will be opened by the Mayor of Burnley. Uh, and, um, and there'll be speeches from members of, uh, from Hungary and from the, um, from Burnley Football Club. Hi everyone, thank you very much for your attendance today. Um, we've got an unveiling today obviously of Jimmy Hogan's headstone. Um, Jimmy um, was a pioneer of football throughout the world um, and he came from our little town here in Germany. Um, he passed away um, and he remained in, a, in an unmarked grave next to his father and mother's grave. Uh, which Stevenson Memorial have done a fantastic job of updating and cleaning. Um, they were just left a little bit uh, grubby with, the, uh, with time, really. Um, I'm really happy that we can do today, we can unveil this headstone uh, for someone that is just, that's just made such an impact in football. And I'm, I'm, I'm seeing all these people here from Fulham, Aston Villa, uh, Bolton, Burnley, uh, and Celtic. We've all got together to remember him um, over 40 years since he passed away. Uh, I, I think that's a fantastic legacy for the gentleman. I'm going to hand over to the Mayor of Burnley, um, who is going to do the unveiling, and he's going to say a few words. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. And welcome everybody here to Burnley this morning on a beautiful day. Uh, it could have been a lot worse, but uh, it's absolutely great to see so many people here uh, today. Uh, we're here to recognise the amazing con contribution of Jimmy Hogan uh, to European football and in doing so honour his contribution uh, to the beautiful game and un unveil a fresh headstone uh, at his burial place uh, here in Burnley Cemetery. It's fantastic as people have just said that we have uh, representatives here from Jimmy's family, from the clubs that he served and the patrons, groups and the individuals who have made this happen today. Jimmy's truly is a remarkable story and worthy of the recognition that he's going to get. Born on the 16th of October 1882, he grew up here in Burnley and was first educated at St Mary Magdalene School uh, here in, as I say, in, the, in the town. He continued his education in Manchester and flirted actually with joining the priesthood. But on, on leaving school, he became a footballer. Started Rochdale, then Burnley, and going on to six other clubs in the UK. 131 appearances in total, 44 goals, and an FA Cup semi final. And may I say, that's quite a really decent strike rate, 44 <laughs> goals in the first game, so well done to him. Uh, he played 50 games here in this town for, for Burnley and scoring 12 goals. Again, quite a, a, a decent record when you compare it with many. He took a break in his playing career at the age of 28 to go and coach. His club at the time, Bolton Wanderers, had been beaten FC Dordrecht 10 0 in a friendly, and he found he vowed to go and teach them how to go and play properly. True to his word, he did. His revolutionary methods got noticed, and whilst he was there, the Netherlands actually appointed him for a game against Germany, which they won 2 1. Now, could you just imagine how that would be seen today with the media that we have around football? <laughs> An absolutely remarkable achievement. He came back to the UK to complete his playing career, after which he went to coach in Switzerland. And I think we should all recognise, you know, we're not talking about this day and age, how brave it was for somebody to actually, you know, think I've got something to offer and I'm going to go overseas and ply my trade. You know, it wasn't the freedom of movement era. It was a time when it was quite difficult to travel and people went, went about their business, but how brave that was. He worked alongside his compatriot, Teddy Duckworth, and Hungarian Isidore Kircher, coaching the Swiss, Swiss national team for the 1924 Olympics, where they got to the final, losing to the best team in the world at the time, Uruguay. Coming back, and after a short spell as Fulham boss, he then went on to form a partnership with Hugo Messi, coaching the Austrian national team. He took them to the 1936 Olympic final. What a fantastic achievements these were. Aston Villa then came calling and he steered them back to the top, top division after they'd been relegated for the first time in their history. His ideas around coaching methods were often dismissed within British football. Focus on ball control, tactics and fitness he really was a coach ahead of his time. Now we had a player around 1966 called Martin Peters, who Alf Ramsey used to say was 10 years ahead of his time. And it certainly sounds like with Jimmy's track record that he was certainly 10 years ahead of his time in where he was taking football at the time. He was a great unseen influence on the next generation of managers in Hungary, the Netherlands and Germany. And then we come to a real watershed moment in international football. In Wembley 1953, England got a 6-3 thrashing from the Hungarian team. And it really was a watershed moment for English football, who basically developed the game up to that point. President Sandor Parks of the Hungarian FA said to the press after the game, Jimmy Hogan taught us everything we know about football. Gustav Seeds, the Hungarian coach, said, 
We play football as Jimmy Hogan taught us. When our history is told, his name should be written in gold letters. Just think about those statements of where we were in those times. We were 13 years before England actually won the World Cup. I'm sure it was a wake-up moment for England at that time, the way football and the Hungarians had brought football to Wembley and taught us how to play in our own backyard. And 13 years later, our country went on to win the World Cup. Who knows what thought Jimmy Hogan had in that in terms of the football that had been played up to that point. Following his football career, he came back to live in Burnley. He passed away in 1974 and he's laid to rest here with his family. And here in Burnley we're extremely proud of that, that he started his life here, he went on to achieve great things and he's now laid to rest here. And now I have the great pleasure in uh, going on unveiling the new headstone and congratulations to all the patrons and individuals who've uh, gone about this project and reached this point. Well done everybody. So it worked, worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Uh -huh. Dear friends, we're gathered here <coughs> this day to pray for Jimmy, whose body lies here in rest. He has passed from death to life in company with the Lord Jesus who died and rose to life, and is purified now of his faults. Let's pray that God may welcome him among the saints in heaven. In any service organised by the church we always have some scripture so I've, my, the first uh, bit of scripture is from the reading is a reading from the letter of St Paul to the Thessalonians. We do not want you to be unaware brothers and sisters about those who have fallen asleep so that you may not grieve like the others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus rose and died and rose so too will God, through Jesus, bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Indeed, we tell you this on the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will surely not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, with a word of command, with the voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God, will come down from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, we should console one another with words such as these. The response to the greeting is, thanks be to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks, thanks be, be to God. God. So we're just going to have one of the Psalms now, and it's a very well known one. So if the response at the end of each verse is, the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Fresh and green are the pastures where he gives me repose. Near restful waters he leads me to revive my drooping spirit. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. He guides me along the right path, he is true to his name. If I should walk in the valley of darkness, no evil would I fear. You are there with your crook and your staff, with these you give me comfort. The Lord, the Lord is my shepherd, shepherd. there is nothing I shall want. You have prepared a banquet for me in the sight of my foes. My head you anoint 